Okay, so again, today we're going to continue with these optimization problems. And here's the problem we faced for example one. We want to find the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in, in a semicircle with a radius r. Okay? All right, and again, so remember, um, r is a constant. You don't know what it is, but it is a constant. Is that clear? Okay, so obviously you want to find the absolute maximum area. And so what I did is, uh, you guys, you don't have to draw it on a coordinate plane, but it does make it easier, okay? So I, what I did is I drew a semicircle on a coordinate plane, okay? And then obviously I just, I inscribed, a, you know, just a, a general rectangle there. And then, so clearly this point x comma y is on the, on the semicircle, right? And so the distance from here to here is x, isn't it? And obviously the distance from here to here is r, correct? Got it? Okay. And, and so basically then, if you think about it, the whole length of the rectangle is 2x, isn't it? And then the height is just y. Got it? See how I set that up? Okay, so then, since I want to maximize area, that's my primary equation, right? Length times width or base times height, okay? And so clearly you need a secondary equation with x and y in it so you can eliminate either x or y. And so um, I think if you, you think about it, you'll, you'll agree with the fact that I'm going to use the equation for the circle as my second equation that, that has x and uh, y in it. And so you all know what the equation of a circle is, right? It's just x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared, right? With me? Okay, and then, if, by the way, if you were going to graph that on a calculator, you'd solve for y, wouldn't you? Then you get plus or minus the square root. And remember, the positive square root is the top half of your circle, isn't it? And the negative square root is the bottom half of your circle. So I'm just going to use the top, okay, because I only have a semicircle. Is that clear? Okay. And so there's my secondary equation, the positive square root. And then obviously I'm going to make the substitution that I did last time. So I'm going to replace y with that right there. Okay, so here it goes. So I go from that to that when I replace y with the square root. And then I want to see if I can come up with a feasible domain, in other words, an interval. Well, if you think about the diagram, what's the least that x is going to be here? What's the least that x is going to be? Zero. And what's, what's the farthest technically that x could extend to what? To r, even though it might not go quite that far. We can at least use that as an upper bound, can't we? Right? And so there's the interval, or feasible domain that we can use for x. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, find the critical numbers by differentiating this. And for derivative purposes, I'm just going to rewrite my equation as that. And so clearly I need the product rule, right? Because I've got that times that. And so that's what I did. To find the derivative, it's the derivative of the first times the second function plus the first function. And then all of this is a derivative of the second function by the chain rule, isn't it? Okay, and then obviously I move that to the bottom to make it a positive exponent. And then I turn it into a square root. That and that turns into a, well, actually, that and that cancel. And then what I have left is a minus 2x squared on top. Okay, and then I think you can see what I did is I, I multiplied the first term by that to get a common denominator. Okay, and that takes me to here. And then from there, I distributed the 2 here and here. And that got me to here. And then I just combined those into a minus 4x squared. So, so there's my derivative. Okay? Got it, guys? And so now, at what values of x will this derivative be 0 or undefined? Well, obviously, if x equals r, the bottom will be 0, causing the derivative to be undefined. But don't I already have x equals r over here as one of my endpoints? So I really don't need to worry about that. So now it just boils down to figure out when the derivative is 0. In other words, when is that equal to 0? And I didn't show all the steps, but if you set it equal to 0 and solve for x, you're going to get uh, the square root of 1 half and then times r. Good? 
All right, and again, it's up to you which method you want to use to finish it. I decided to use method one. Okay, so what I did then is, um, obviously the maximum area has to occur either at one of these endpoints or at the critical number in between. So what I did is I just evaluated the area formula at those three values and again you can see what I did there. So I just plugged in a zero and I get an area of zero. Plugged in an R, I get an area of zero, right? And when I plugged in the critical number into my area formula and simplified, it turned out to be R squared. Now, as long as that's a positive number, which it is, right, R squared will be positive, then that's my maximum area. Does that make sense? Okay. And so there you go. So the maximum area is R, A equals R squared, and it will occur when X equals square root of uh, 1 half R. And I didn't find Y but you could. Uh, and again, the reason I didn't find y is because it didn't ask for it. All it asks is for the what? Find the what? Just said find the what? Area. And so that's really all I needed to do. I didn't really need to uh, find y. That's why I didn't do it. But if it asks you to find the dimensions, then you would need to find y as well. Okay? And to do that, obviously, you would just plug this into the, uh, maybe that formula right there, right, to get y. Right. Any questions on example one? Okay, now obviously the next two examples you're going to have to, you know, write things down. Okay, and again, uh, each example is different than the last, so make sure you get all three of them. Ready? Okay, so here's the problem. Okay, they talk about this rectangle A, A, B, C, D, which is inscribed in the region enclosed by the graph of this parabola. So clearly this parabola here is what they're talking about. Okay, there's the parabola. And you've got this rectangle inscribed uh, between the graph of the parabola and the x-axis, right? Got it? Um, you want to find the x and y coordinates of point C right here. so that the area is maximized. Got it? Okay, so the question is, where do I put point C to make that inscribed rectangle as large as possible? That's, that's what we're asking, right? Okay. So, clearly you want to find the absolute maximum area of the rectangle. And so, uh, how about, uh, I don't know. Alex, what's, what's the primary equation here, though, then? Now be careful. Remember, this is x comma y, so it's x from here to here. So what's your area? What's your primary equation? Yeah, isn't it 2x times y again, guys? Right? Because again, if it's x from the, um, the y-axis to d, then clearly the whole length of the rectangle is 2 times x, and then the height is just the y-coordinate of that point, isn't it? Okay, guys? All right, and how about uh, Maria? What is the uh, secondary equation here? What do you think? Yeah. Shouldn't we just use the equation for the parabola here as my secondary equation? That makes sense, right? That relates x and y as well. Okay, and so now you're going to make the substitution. Replace y with that right here. And to make things easier, I'm going to distribute the 2x. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Well, it is, but. All that does is, is stop, uh, you know, the, the height from going below the x-axis, which is all that does is really make the height of the rectangle y. That's all that really does, right? Okay. Okay, and so any other questions? Okay, now see if we can come up with an interval. In other words, 
a feasible domain for x. What's the least that x is going to be? Haley, what do you think? Yeah. Zero. Okay, good. And Jack, what's the most that x is going to be? Well, just tell me where is it going to go, and we'll figure out what it is. The furthest it's going to go is to where? Yeah, so the x-intercept of the parabola is what we need to find, is, isn't it? To figure out this, you know, how far over that, that point D can extend, technically. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to set your equation for the parabola equal to 0, right? Replace y with 0 to figure out the x-intercept, right? And so if you do that, obviously you get plus and minus 1. So obviously that would be 1. Everybody agree that furthest it can extend is 1? Okay? <coughs> All right, so now we've got to find the critical numbers. So, Kevin, what's my derivative here? And then what? Plus what? <coughs> Eight. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, you could put, technically, you can put those in there if you want. Not a big deal. Okay. And so, obviously, this is never going to be undefined, but it might be zero. So I set it equal to zero and solve for x to find my critical numbers. So now remember, if we're only going to worry about this interval, I don't really need to worry about the negative square root of one-third. Do I as, as a critical number? Do I need to worry about that? No. So I'm just going to keep the, the positive square root of one-third. Okay, and by the way, leave it like that. Don't, don't take the square root of one over the square root of three. You can do that later if you want, but leave it like that for right now. Okay? Got it? Okay. Okay, so... You know, it's up to you which method you want to use to finish this, to, you know, show or, you know, or find out if, you know, this is going to be where the maximum area would occur. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute the endpoints of my interval and that critical number into the area formula to see which one gives me the maximum area, Okay. So if I plug a 0 into here, I get what, guys? You can do that in your head. What do you get? 0. Okay. If I plug 1 into there, what do I get? If I plug a 1 there and a 1 there, what do I get? 0. And so then when I plug in the square root of 1 third, let's see what happens. Ready? You know what? Here's what I'm going to do, you guys. I, you see, because you have a square root, I'm going to plug it into there instead. Doesn't that make more sense so that the square root will go away when I square that? Do you see why I'm going to plug it into here instead of this form? It just makes the simplifying a little bit easier, right? So let me do that. Okay, and as long as this is a positive number, um, then this is going to be my ma maximum area, isn't it? As long as this turns out to be a positive number. Okay, Christine, with me? Yeah. And so if I get rid of the square root, I basically have negative, what, 4 thirds plus 4, which is how many thirds? What's negative 4 thirds plus 4, which is 12 thirds? What is it? 8 thirds. 
And so you end up with, uh, what, 16 thirds times that. And if you want, you can break down that square root now. Right? And you get 1 over the square root of 3. And if you get rid of the radical, I don't know if this is any nicer. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so that's the maximum area. It is a positive number, so that is the maximum area. And so make sure you answer the question. They didn't really ask for the maximum area. They just asked to find what? The point x comma y, right? And so the point is um, square root of 1 third comma, well, I need to find the y value, right? And so... Let me do that on a separate piece of paper because I'm running out of room here. Okay, well, let me just show it. <laughs> Is that right, guys? Good or no? So that's the point, okay, where you need to put the corner of the rectangle to make the biggest area under the curve with, uh, inside the rectangle. Does that make sense? Okay? Okay, one more. Ready? And of course, this is the trickiest one of them all. Okay, so we've got a right circular cylinder inscribed inside of a sphere of radius uh, big R. We want to find the largest possible volume of such a cylinder, okay? Okay, so we want to draw a diagram. Ready? Okay, there's your sphere. And then inside the sphere, you've got a cylinder. So I'm going to, well, I'll come back to that. Okay, so what are we trying to maximize here, guys? We're trying to find the largest possible volume of the what? Cylinder. Cylinder. So, uh, how about Anthony? What would be the uh, primary equation then if we're trying to maximize the volume of the cylinder? Okay. And by the way, I better start labeling with some variables here before I write the formula, just so my variables are consistent. And so they use big R for the radius of the what? Sphere. And so let me label that. That big R is the radius of the sphere. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use little r for the radius of the cylinder. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. And I'm going to use um, H for the height of the cylinder. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. So, all right. So, Anthony, back to your um, equation. So, what would be the primary equation then? V equals what? Okay. Pi little r squared H. Everybody agree? Okay. 
All right. And now, this is a tricky part. There's no obvious secondary equation here. I mean, you don't want to use surface area or anything like that because, you know, we don't have any information on that, and that would just complicate things. So you're not going to use surface area or anything like that. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to really study the diagram and get creative in coming up with a second equation that might have what in it. It needs to have what in it? Little r and what? Yeah, well, remember, big R is a constant, so it can have that as well. That's not a problem, right? Got it? But it definitely has to have little r and little h, yes? It can have big R as well because r, big R is just a constant, right? Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, so, yeah, so here's what we're going to do. Ready? Let me get a different color pen or pencil here. See this little right triangle here? You see that? Everybody see that little green right triangle I just drew? All right, let's pull that off to the side and let's talk about it. Do I know the length of this side right here, guys? Yeah, what is it? That's just another way of saying what? Big R, isn't it? Isn't that also the, the radius of the sphere, sphere going from the center to the edge of the sphere like that, where those come together? Isn't that also big R? Okay, what's the distance from here to here? Half H, isn't it? That's half, of, half the height of the cylinder, isn't it? For sure. Okay, and then what is it from here to here? little r, isn't it? Isn't it? And so what might we be able to use then to come up with an equation that relates all of these? Pythagorean theorem, because we got a right triangle and we want to talk about all three sides. So clearly we're going to use Pythagorean theorem as our secondary equation. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, so let's do it. So I can say r squared little r squared plus one half h squared equals big R squared. And if you simplify that, um, you get this. All right, now let's talk about that. Go ahead and write that down. We need to talk about what kind of substitution we're going to make here. Okay, so the bottom line is we want to replace either r or h, right? <coughs> So you could solve for h, but that would involve a square root, wouldn't it? I mean, that would work, okay? So that's a possibility. What's your other possibility? You could solve for r, or better yet, you could just solve for what? r squared to make the substitution probably as nice as it can be in this situation, yes? So everybody agree? You, you got to think about what you're going to make, make the substitution on here. And the, mo the thing that makes the most sense is to solve this for a little r squared and just replace little r squared right there and, and make it a little bit nice to finish. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So my secondary equation then would be um, r squared equals big R squared minus one-fourth h squared. And so now I'm going to make the substitution, replace that with that right there. Are we good? Okay, here we go. Okay, you probably want, for derivative purposes, you're going to probably want to distribute the pi and the h at the same time, and that turns the equation into this. Remember, h is a variable, big R is a constant. Remember that. Now, remember, our variable here is h. So if you're going to come up with an interval, it's going to have h in it, right? Okay. And so, Lauren, what's the least that h can be? Just think about it. h is a height, so what's the least it could be? Zero, technically, right? Now, look at your diagram and think about it. 
what's the most that H can be? If you make H really, really tall and skinny, at the very, very, very most, technically, what can you pick for an upper limit here on H? What do you think, uh, Max? Yeah, is, I mean, if it, if it goes as high as from here to here, is that going to be just twice the radius of the sphere, isn't it? You agree that the H could be at most from here to here at the very, very, very most, which would be two times big R? <coughs> okay, so we can just study the diagram to see that, that the two times big R is the very, very, very most that H could be. Okay? Okay, so now it's time to find the critical numbers. Now be careful. I can't say it enough. R is a what? Constant. So, if R is a constant, what would be the derivative of that right there? What do you think? Be careful here. Uh, Christina, what do you think? If R is a constant, what's the derivative of pi R squared H with respect to H? It'd just be pi R squared. Good. And then minus, go ahead, Christine, what's the derivative of this? But do you agree? Yes? Okay. All right, now you've got to find the critical numbers H, okay? So what values of H would make this zero or undefined? Well, so I don't think it's ever going to be undefined, but it might be zero. And so um, instead of getting a common denominator, I think this one might be a little bit easier just to set it equal to zero and solve. So doing that, let's see. <coughs> and isn't that just uh, square root of four thirds? times big R, isn't it guys? Is that what it simplifies to? Square root of four thirds times big R for my critical number? Okay? Okay, so again, I think uh, this is one where, you know, you can use either method, I don't really care. Uh, but I think method one might be a little bit cleaner because trying to substitute stuff in this derivative to fi figure out if it's positive or negative, you can do it. But that might be a little bit uh, you know, trickier than just going ahead and looking at the, 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 th the three volumes, right? Okay, so I think I'm going to use method one, but it's up to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate my volume formula at h equals 0, h equals 2r, and then at h equals that, and then just see which has the largest volume. It's got the large, largest volume has to occur at one of those three values, doesn't it? Yes? Okay. So here we go. So if I put in a zero for H, so if I put a zero there and a zero there, what do I get for the volume, guys? If I put a zero there and a zero there, what do I get? A zero. Okay, what do I get for the volume if I put in a 2R? If I put a 2R there, right, and I put a 2R there, let's see what happens. Well, if I cube 2R, don't I get 8R cubed? And isn't that going to turn into a 2? And so don't you get... Uh, 2 pi r cubed minus 2 pi r cubed, which is 0. Okay, and then the last thing we got to do is evaluate our volume at this formula. As long as this turns out to be a positive number, I know that's my maximum volume, right? Agreed? And I'm running out of space here, so let me use separate paper. Um, and again, you guys, beca see because I have a square root, which formula would be easier to plug into, this one or this one? Because of the square root, wouldn't it be easier to plug it into that one right here? So that when I square the h, the, the square root will cancel out nicely for me? 
You see why I'm plugging it into this one instead of this one? Everybody see that? Okay, so let's do it. Okay, and so when I simplify that mess, let's see, what does that equal here, guys? Wait a second here. Oh, yeah, I forgot to plug it in here. I knew something was right. Okay, so I plug it in uh, here as well, right? Okay, and so let's see what happens when I simplify. Well, at least the square root cancels out there. Right? And you guys, um, just look at this as being r squared minus one-third r squared. What's r squared minus one-third r squared? Two-thirds r squared. And we can probably keep simplifying that, can't we, guys? I'm going to do it down here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make it square root of 4 over the square root of 3, which is just 2, right? And so I get what? Let's see. Um, 4, 4 thirds, I put the pi on top, square root of 3 on the bottom, I get r cubed, right? Which is clearly a positive number, isn't it? Isn't that clearly a positive number? So I know this is my maximum area, isn't it? Yes? And so I'm pretty much done. Now, again, if, if that's not the answer that you see on, a, you know, on the answer key of the book or on the, on the test, then maybe you can simplify it further. So what, uh, what could I do to simplify that further? Maybe get rid of the radical in the denominator, right? And so if you do that, it turns into what, guys? Let's see, 4 square root of 3 pi over what? 9 r cubed. And again, did I answer the question? What did it ask for? It asked for the what? The maximum volume. Isn't that my answer then and I'm done? You see why I'd want to use method one anyway? Because it did ask for the maximum volume. And so I'm not going to get the maximum volume right away if I use method two. So that's another reason why I'd rather use method two on a question like this where it's actually asking for the maximum volume. Does that make sense? Okay. Good? Okay. So by the way, let me let me write that in here. <clears throat>